real pleasure to be back uh, in Dublin and thank you ever so much to be back in Dublin and to be back amongst um, friends. Ambassador, uh, anyone who takes on this role has enormous amounts of courage, I think, coming to Ireland and, and making the case for Israel here. Uh, and it's a great pleasure to have met you this evening. Morris, you have so many years of experience leading the Jewish community here in Ireland. Um, and that is experience that I know that you've built up and in correspondence and previous exchanges with UK Lawyers for Israel, we've had the, the great privilege and benefit of, of that. Jackie, what a phenomenon. Uh, it's an absolute honor to call you a, a friend and colleague. Um, it's been a, a joy to work together with you in the past. Um, and you've done so much uh, for the Israel um, the understanding of Israel here, the Ireland Israel Alliance has um, is indefatigable uh, in promoting that cause and in explaining away so many of the misrepresentations. Uh, and of course, the uh, formidable uh, Alan Chatter. Um, I've had the pleasure of seeing you in action so many times in Audrey. Um, the pleasure of hearing you speak, and I, I understand now this evening hearing you sing as well. Um, so. On the basis of all of that, it's, it's wonderful to share a moment of celebration, uh, I think, first and foremost. But the title um, of this evening um, is Issues and Challenges Facing Israel. And especially in light of uh, the very recent report of David Collier into uh, anti-Semitism in Ireland, so much of that, of course, for anyone in the room who's uh, had the misfortune um, of having to go through that material, is so closely tied, is inextricably linked with Israel and the way that it is viewed, uh, the way that it is discussed uh, in politics, in the media, uh, on social media, uh, unfortunately uh, through, uh, through many mediums in, in religion. Um, and that poses uh, a very significant challenge uh, for anyone within Ireland, or indeed around the world, but Ireland very much is at the forefront um, of grappling with those difficulties, those misrepresentations. Um, and in trying to understand the challenges and the issues uh, that we face in the UK as well uh, as over here, trying to understand the delegitimization of Israel uh, and the misinformation that is spread over it, the uh, explanation that I have uh, found most helpful was that proffered by uh, the late great Lord uh, Rabbi Jonathan Sachs in his description of the evolution of anti-Semitism. Uh, and for those of you that are familiar with the analysis, he explained that it began arguably in the Middle Ages uh, with a focus on religion, where uh, anti-Semitism uh, focused on anti-Judaism and the blood libel was developed, the, the notion that Jews killed Christian children uh, to use their blood in making matzah for Passover. Uh, and also the well poison libels uh, were commonly used. Well, society moved on, uh, and in many respects, uh, science took over as the focus uh, for many of the communities, as the new order of the day. And so hatred of the Jews morphed into one that was focused on the Jewish race. Uh, and you have the pseudoscience of eugenics was developed uh, and it, it focused on justifying that sort of hatred. Well, Lord Sachs uh, proffered that the modern order of the day had moved on even from science and that today it focused on uh, international law and human rights. That was the highest order. And then of course, the hatred of the Jews had morphed into the world of human rights and international law and was focused on the Jewish state. And in addition to the security challenges, which we all know and understand, and, and the ambassador has spoken to this evening, that Israel has become adept at grappling with, miracle after miracle, war after war, that Israel uh, managed to develop new technologies to combat the military threats uh, that it has met at every turn. Well, the new challenge, rooted as it is in human rights and international law, is the abuse of international law, as I see it. The misrepresentations, both about the actions of the State of Israel, but also the realities of international law. And so, occupation, 
ethnic cleansing, uh, colonialism, those uh, misrepresentations, those myths are the modern bloodline. Uh, and the fact that those, those slurs are acceptable uh, in the parliament, that they are aired in the uh, oructus, that we heard them uh, when the, the team was back together about six months ago, making representations to the uh, Foreign Affairs and Defence Committee, that the questions or statements rather put to the members of the committee, and it was the former ambassador uh, Ophir Karif uh, who was speaking on that occasion, were reminiscent of the bloodline. And one sees that this is perhaps not such a new trend. Already in 2011, uh, Mahmoud Abbas wrote an op-ed in the New York Times. And I'm so sorry, people at the back can't hear. Uh, that wasn't quite apparent to me. Uh, well, you're just in time for me to perhaps read a very short extract of the uh, op-ed in the New York Times that Mahmoud Abbas wrote in 2011, uh, which I think set the stage very much for where we are now. Uh, he said, Palestine's admission to the United Nations would pave the way for the internationalization of the conflict as a legal matter, not uh, just a political one. It would pave the way for us to promote uh, and pursue claims against Israel, the United Nations, human rights treaty bodies, and at the International Court of Justice. So that was Mahmoud Abbas's declaration of lawfare, the abuse of international legal institutions to continue to wage war against Israel uh, where conventional means had failed. For example, uh, in claims at the ICJ, which the International Court of Justice, which has brought against the Americans uh, for daring to open an embassy in Jerusalem. Uh, the case that it is pursuing at the International Criminal Court uh, is entirely underpinned by uh, this notion of warfare and also by armies of NGOs, an industry of NGOs that has been developed and is very well funded uh, to provide the fodder for uh, the International Criminal Court to investigate and for one committee after another at the United Nations to make condemnations based upon that misinformation uh, and those uh, distortions. And we saw this recently and very unfortunately Ireland took part in the fourth Durban conference uh, at the United Nations General Assembly in uh, New York and we see it on a regular basis in Geneva where at the UN Human Rights Council Israel is a standing agenda item, item seven, and I have been there a number of times myself to witness uh, the outrageous accusations that are levied. And simply saying it isn't true, obviously, uh, doesn't cut it. And the difficulties that we face are in explaining away these untruths. And the fact that for the vast majority of people, and I see it here, especially in the press and in politics, there simply isn't the uh, bandwidth to listen. And I appreciate that many of you have had these experiences over and over again. On a positive note, um, what I can offer, perhaps, is to say you're not alone. And I think events like this and bringing people together from various jurisdictions uh, underscore that important message because it can feel like a very lonely battle explaining away all of the untruths that everyone uh, with very limited knowledge and understanding of the background and the history. And of course, what the State of Israel stands for will struggle to be able to grasp because Israel is a very unusual state. Israel is unique not just because it is the only Jewish state. It is unique because it is the only true democracy in the Middle East. It is unique in the Middle East in that the Christian population in Israel has increased um, over the last decades where everywhere else across that region it has decreased. It is unique uh, in that Israel is the only state, while it had, uh, has sovereignty over Jerusalem, to have allowed freedom of religion in Jerusalem. Although I think we have to qualify that with the fact that uh, the one exception is that there is no freedom of religion for Jews on the Temple Mount, uh, a concession that has been made in the interests of peaceful coexistence. 
And so what do we have to uh, perhaps understand to better explain uh, the, the realities on the ground as were referenced by the ambassador, the security situation that Israel finds itself in? Um, that is very difficult, I think, for anyone to comprehend when you, outside of Israel, when you see um, constant tales of the strength of Israel, uh, the ingenuity of the country, uh, leading in tech, leading in the defense industry. Uh, it's very difficult to understand the sorts of threats that Israelis face on a daily basis. It's also very difficult to understand the history that many Israelis have grown up with. And to be able to convince ordinary Israelis who have seen uh, for decades uh, every concession leading to blood on the streets, to be able to convince those ordinary Israelis that next time will be different, that they just need to keep uh, undertaking uh, the same exercise and hoping uh, for goodwill on the other side is a, is a very difficult exercise and it's certainly not one uh, that I um, can see um, being explained in any, in any meaningful way uh, in the current circumstances. On the basis of all of the um, sort of negativity that I, I'm, I'm afraid was merited by the title of Issues and Challenges Facing Israel, um, it strikes me that there is an incredibly powerful weapon that we have on this side uh, of the table, and that is the truth. Uh, and one of the issues that uh, I took that was positive from the report that David Collier put together is the ease with which he was able to debunk all of the appalling material that he put uh, into that report after years of uh, research. And although it might be more complex than the uh, lies that come from the other direction, the truth, I still believe, will out. Uh, and there isn't really very much choice in the matter. I certainly won't be giving up. I very much hope that you won't either. We each of us have a role to play uh, in fighting that battle and making sure uh, that as many people as possible in whatever industry you may be working in uh, or in terms of letters or writing to your members of parliament uh, and taking part in those debates. The last time I was in Ireland um, I went in some detail into international war behind uh, the question of settlements and the status of the territory um, and there are very compelling arguments in international law that uh, state Israel's case very clearly but they don't really need to be gone into as long as the fundamentals uh, are clear. And so far as um, the rights, uh, the right of the Jewish state to exist and to flourish, uh, the right of Jews uh, to live uh, wherever they want, um, or put another way, uh, pushing back against the notion that Jews shouldn't be living in certain areas just because they're Jews. The issues of Israel uh, and the issues of anti-Semitism are inextricably linked. Uh, and unfortunately, we need to be prepared to fight uh, on both fronts at the same time and try and make that message as clear as possible. I very much look forward to your questions later and perhaps a discussion over the refreshments afterwards. But as I say, it is a great pleasure to be here and to see the enthusiasm uh, and the um, energy that the, Israel, uh, the Island Israel Alliance uh, and the other organisations here bring to this matter. It certainly keeps us going in the UK. We know that you're very much at the coalface. So thank you very much, everyone, for what you're doing.